anything like a psychedelic society. The idea would have been unthinkable somehow in 1989 uh, for the university to even allow that. That's a sign of things having changed over the last 20 years or so. But um, the only thing which you could have called heretical, I think, back then, that I, that I remember was a parapsychology society. There's, yeah, I remember seeing a poster for a UKC parapsychology society. And I remember being outraged, because I was a very different person then. I was, I was young, I was very sure of myself. I was studying mathematics, and I was sure that maths and science explained everything. I was one of those skeptical reductionists. I wasn't part of any sort of organized skeptical thing, but it's just my personal orientation was, I don't believe in any of that. It's outrageous that the university should allow a like, parapsychology society, and that means some academic is actually um, sponsoring it. It's, you know, I, I wasn't outraged enough to start a campaign, but I remember being shocked. Anyway, um, that was before I was exposed to psychedelic culture and thinking. Um, and by the time I was doing my PhD, which was also here, uh, that had changed. I'd, I'd become um, exposed to those things. And I was a bit less willing to dismiss things. Uh, my, my sense of reality had perhaps broadened. So the idea of parapsychology didn't seem so outrageous to me. You know, ESP, telepathy, psychokinesis. It didn't mean I believed in them all, just that I wasn't going to just laugh at the very idea of them. Um, and I ended up reading something, I can't remember where it was, about psychokinesis experiments in the 70s. And um, psychokinesis, you probably know, is, is what's colloquially called mind over matter. And in its, its sort of cartoon form is when I sort of send out waves from my brain and make this thing move across the table. That's not something that happens uh, very often, if at all, and so it's very hard to study it in the lab. There's anecdotal evidence of such things. But what you can study, that's called macro-psychokinesis. Micro-psychokinesis, again, I'm not saying I believe in any of this, just telling you what people are studying. Micro-psychokinesis is when you can supposedly influence events at a much smaller physical scale. So the classic example is a random number generator. You have an electronic device. Uh, it could involve radioactive decay, sort of Geiger counter kind of thing or it could involve noise diodes. In both cases, you're using a sort of quantum-based level of reality to create purely random output. No, you can't possibly predict, there's no patterns, and you just make it spit out zeros and ones, and you get somebody to focus on a screen where there's like maybe two, light, two different colored lights, or you're hearing two sounds in each of two headphones, and this is being driven by the random number generator, and it's your task to try and skew distribution one way or the other, more this way, more that way. And some, it seems, from some of the, the micro-psychokinesis um, stuff that I was reading from the 70s, from seemingly the more reputable researchers, of course they're all accused of being frauds and making it up and being sloppy by people who have decided already that that's the case, and there are people like that, and they do organize these groups, and they do edit Wikipedia pages very vigorously, um, which is an interesting social phenomenon. They might be right, but they, they're very organized about it. Um, anyway, so microcyclic I was interested in this mainly when I found out that Helmut Schmidt, a German researcher, um, there was a German chancellor and statesman of, of that name as well, but this, is, this was just a, a minor, um, parapsycho well, major parapsychologist, but um, not a household name. And he discovered that this random, these random number generators could be seemingly influenced by certain people. And what we're not talking about skewing the distribution from a 50-50 output, you know, if it's spitting out zeros and ones like tossing a coin. It's not like someone's able to make it go 80-20 or something. It's not that kind of like superpower thing. It's more maybe 50.5, 50.2 but over a very long time, this is the important thing. If you just did that for a little while, it's like, well, yes, of course, it's never going to be exactly 50%. But if you could hold it at 50.4 for a very long run, that's statistically hugely significant. Any of you who do any kind of statistical analysis know what I'm talking about. And that's the kind of research that's going on. And it seems that these, these effects could go on even if the data was pre-recorded, even if the zeros and ones that were being received by the, the, the subject in the experiment that they were trying to influence were coming off a tape that had been recorded a week ago or a month ago or six, six years ago. It didn't seem to matter as long as no one else had observed it. If it was unobserved data, it was easy enough to do, just hook up your machine to a tape machine and then you put it away in a vault, you get it out and you have someone do the same experiment you've, had them, you've been doing with them before, where they were using like live random number generators, but now it's stuff that was pre-recorded and they don't know that and they're trying to influence it I mean, they're not even thinking about random number generators, they just see these red and green lights or something, and they're just trying to, it's like a psychic video game. 
and it's, it's fun to do this, and I've, I've got involved in it myself, as I'm going to explain, because I found out that Helmut Schmidt's um, retropsychokinesis research, well, when I found out about it, I, um, I realized that the, web, the, the World Wide Web, which had just become a thing, this is like 1996, I finished my PhD, and um, I was uh, just sort of floating around thinking about things which interested me, and um, the web had come online, which was a you know, fascinating thing at the time, completely uncommercialized at that stage and full of, sort of visionaries and, um, and a very optimistic sort of community. And I saw the potential for the web as a, um, a very sort of accessible and open, verifiable framework within which this kind of research could be done. So rather than having to bring people into a laboratory and say, right, now sit in this chair and I'm going to set you up with this thing, and then having to publish my research and then deal with people that are saying that I'm fraudulent or that I'm sloppy in my experimental methods and you know, disbelieving me anyway. And also people being nervous in, in that role as, as subjects in an experiment like that. I had this idea, well, with the web, you could run the same experiments using a website. And this is what I did in 1996, only a few years after I ridiculed the idea of having a UKC parapsychology society. I came back here, and, um, uh, I came back here humbled, and uh, I'm looking for a website with a PowerPoint slide, here we are. And Peter Moore, who I think may still be here in the Religious Studies Department, if not, he was until quite recently. Um, do you know Cameron? No, I don't know. Uh, he's, no. He's, uh, some of those reading groups we went to, he used to show up. Mm. But uh, he didn't remember me, but back in 96, um, he agreed to sponsor me uh, to, as an outsider. I mean, I, I wasn't really affiliated with the university. So as part of the School of Classics, Philosophy and Religious Studies, I was running this completely insane-looking parapsychology uh, project online. Um, and he was happy to sponsor that. He was the one that was the sponsor of the Parapsychology Society. Um, and the idea was to run experiments whereby uh, there were three experiments. These were written as JavaScript applets, which I commissioned. And the idea in this one is you're trying to get this line, this vertical line, to go left or right. In this one, you're trying to get the clock to go clockwise or anti-clockwise, or I think maybe speed up and slow down. And with this one, you're trying to get the pendulum to swing wide or narrow. And in all cases, what you're seeing is being driven by a bunch of random zeros and ones, which were recorded ages ago. Um, it was a, a Geiger counter in Switzerland in 1996 hooked up to a, a computer, basically with some strontium, measuring radioactive decay, which is the most random thing in the universe. It's, not, it's what's being called God's dice. You cannot in any way predict um, the timings of radioactive decay, so they make very good random number generators. So when, if I were to run one of these, which unfortunately, um, because I wrote this, this is like web archaeology, this is from 96. Sorry, if this your browser doesn't understand Java applets, I've tried it in all different browsers. Um, I wrote this, or the person that wrote this wrote it in a version which is just long dead. Now, this thing, but this thing was running for about 15 years. Last time I checked in with it, about five years ago, it had been referenced in various parapsychology literature. It had gathered huge amount, a huge amount of data, because basically anyone could just stumble upon this site, which just looks kind of weird and interesting. What's this about? Go to the experiments, and suddenly, before you know it, you're running an experiment. And if you want to, you can put your email address in and it can, you can basically clock up lots of experiments and it can sort of notice that certain people have got seemingly abilities which could be um, studied more closely. But the problem was, I just stormed into the parapsychology scene like a bull in the china shop. I, I hadn't really looked at how things were done. And a lot of the established experimenters were sort of horrified that this young idiot had just basically just stormed into the web with this massive sort of global experiment which had no sort of sensitivity in terms of like screening people, it's just open to everybody. So that any, any data you get is going to be totally diluted and they had various other criticisms. And I, I wasn't trying to, I wasn't convinced that retropsychokinesis was real, I simply could see that there was a way you could test it in a completely verifiable way so that any skeptic, you could say, okay, you don't believe this, I've got somebody here that can influences pre-recorded random data, you don't believe me? Here's, let's, let's generate some data now, I take a copy, you take a copy, lock it away, get my experiment to run, the person seemingly influences the data, now look at, look at your data, bam. That would be the cartoon version of how you could prove to somebody who really wanted to know that it was genuinely happening and you don't have to have any, any oversight in the experimentation. So this was, this was my big idea and it was, there was a kind of, um, like a crazed sort of Gnostic activism thing going on at the time. So, you know, this is 20 years ago, and I, I felt that if there was something in this, and having been exposed to psychedelic thinking and consciousness, 
and culture, it seemed quite reasonable to me that something like retro psychokinesis, that, that the future might be somehow influencing the present, in, or that the present might be somehow conditional on the future, and thereby the past from the present. That didn't seem so insane to me, and I thought if I can prove to the world conclusively that this is going on, that's going to bring the, the walls of consensus reality crashing down, and that was my biggest kind of ambition, I think. Um, which sounds a bit crazy now, but um, I, was, I was getting quite impatient with the world for, for being stuck in this consensus reality and I wanted to do something about it. But it, eventually I realised I hadn't really gone about it in a very helpful way, but I thought, well, I'll let the experiment run, and it, as I said, it ran for about 15 years at least. Um, but what I was left with was more an interest in um, alternate models of time. In the process of putting the site together, I collected lots of literature, so that site, what's good about that site is it's got a big set of links, well, a lot of the links are dead, this is, as I said, like a 20-year-old site. But it's got uh, resources which are, which are still stable and live, um, and one of them is a, a bibliography that this German uh, ally put together for me. Um, and, you know, I'll just scroll through it, I mean, if you're just defending back with causation, time asymmetry, time reversal, irreversibility, these are things in physics journals and philosophy journals, this isn't sort of wacky stuff. But, um, Almost everything in this bibliography has got something to do with backwards time, multi-dimensional time, imaginary time in the mathematical sense, fuzzy time, fractal time, you know, the arrow of time. There's, look, just, I mean, there's a lot of it. And um, so I just got interested in the idea that time might not be quite what we're told it is, um, what you call temporology. And I was getting all of these ideas together, this idea of this parasite, this uh, psycho retro psychokinesis project. I got this together just after I'd been to Mexico, um, and this is the thing I'm best known for, which is sort of unfortunate, but it's just the way things were, uh, the way things happened. Um, and I've talked about this so many times already to people that it gets a bit tired, and you can check it out online if you want. But Terence McKenna, a lot of you, those of you from the Psychedelic Society, and I think there's some Philosophy Society people, Terence McKenna, if you didn't know, was a sort of maverick psychedelic philosopher, very entertaining character, not totally um, believable in everything he said, but you know, worth, worth checking out if you're, if you're not familiar with him. And um, he and his brother went to, to the Amazon in the 70s looking for, um, basically looking for ayahuasca, but ended up finding psilocybin and taking huge doses and having heroic type experiences as he described in these sort of, uh, you know, 40 day trip in, in communion with the, the universal mind, supposedly wherein it was revealed that there was a map of time to be found in the I Ching, the Chinese oracle. And, um, and Terence, uh, kind of, this was 75, nobody noticed this book just came and went, hardly any copies sold. But then it got sort of rebooted in the 90s like this, and, and the mathematics had been slightly influenced, it had been updated and influenced by fractals, and um, it had a, a sort of snazzy endorsement on the back from some interesting kind of popular culture figures. <coughs> and, uh, and he was suddenly on the, on the lecture circuit and he was promoting psychedelic culture and he was making collaborative records with electronic music dance producers. He, he was kind of a name on the scene in the 90s. Um, he became kind of like the new Timothy Leary, if you like. And but I was interested as a mathematician. I was, I was interested to hear what he had to say about psychedelics and a lot of what he had to say was fascinating and there was no one else out there saying these things as eloquently. But he had this idea about this fractal time wave, uh, this, this thing that was buried in the I Ching. Um, and here he is, pointing at his computer software back in the early 90s, <coughs> showing this, this fractal graph that, that he constructed, starting with this. This is the sequence of hexagrams in the I Ching, the King Wen sequence. If you don't know the I Ching, it's a, a Chinese oracle, a sort of fortune telling device with 64 chapters. Each one's represented by one of these symbols, which is made of six lines. So there are 64 of them, because each line's kind of yin or yang. And it's, it's a puzzling sequence. There's no obvious pattern in it, other than that the, 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 they come in pairs, obvious pairs geometrically. But other than that, it's not clear why they're in that order. But it's a very old sequence. And the, the mushroom logos, as he called it, told him basically to look into that for a matter of time. And he made this um, graph. Uh, but this is the number of changing lines between uh, between these uh, hexagrams in sequence. If you count how many lines change from one to the next, and you make a graph, you get that. Now you might think, why would you do that? But that's what he did. Um, what's interesting is that he took that and then he flipped it upside down and made a backwards copy of it. And then he combined them, sort of meshed them on top of each other, and then stretched them and rescaled them several times in a way which was sort of linked to the I Ching, but in a sort of quite sketchy and archaic way. And he made this thing. 
And he, he said that this was like the basic unit. This is the sort of the shape of time which operates at all scales, microseconds or billions of years. And so that you have to layer it on top of itself in all scales. So he built this kind of fractal wave which looked like this. Now, as I said, it wasn't really like that in the original book. It kind of got tight. It got, it got sort of um, ameliorated in the, in the intervening years. And he, he wasn't really straightforward about that, which was you know, a bit of a problem. Um, but it was, it was made to look as if he'd stumbled upon the idea of fractals before everyone else had on the mushroom trip, which wasn't really the case. But the idea resonated. I can see he, he, the idea of fractals resonated with him because he was talking about something like a, a structure within time that operated at all scales. And by iterating it in the way he did, he ended up with the whole thing crashing down to zero. Now you might think, what's this representing? What's this up and down thing representing? This is supposed to be historical time. And it was what he called novelty, and he was, he was interested in the ingression of novelty <coughs> into the world. And this, the idea, the reason I'm talking about this in a talk about um, retro causality is because the idea is, is, is something that the end of nature Greek well, word, ancient Greek word eschaton that he liked, eschatology, to roughly meaning the end of the world. But the idea that there was a point he predicted in uh, December 2012, this is the bit you've probably heard of if you've heard anything about him, the end of the Mayan calendar or the end of one of the big cycles anyway, uh, it, it's come and gone. But he died in 2000. And in the 90s, he was basically saying that point there where this wave goes down to zero is, 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 is what he called time wave zero. This is when you get an infinite level of novelty entering the universe. And, um, and this is where we have a singularity beyond which you can't sort of predict anything. And he didn't actually say what would actually happen. He let people sort of speculate on that. He threw out some ideas. But he was basically pushing a kind of really interesting psychedelic end of the world scenario that a lot of people bought into because it, it was like a really it was like a good end of the world. It was like it get more and more amazing and kind of hyperspatial and um, expansive in terms of possibility and, and just blasting off out of the bounds of normal space time into something you know, unimaginably psychedelic and beautiful. It seemed to be the sort of the optimistic sort of description of it that, that I was getting. Um, he was promoting this very very powerful psychedelic called DMT, which he felt was the sort of making this clear to anyone who took it. But the date itself, fixing that date was problematic because the date came and went and uh, now the, the idea's been discredited. But I delved into this. Um, I was the first person to actually bother looking at it. I was like, how did he get that? What's, what's going on here? And he provided me with the original manuscripts and the computer code that was used to generate the wave. And I, there was just some problems with the way he did it. It was a bit arbitrary and he didn't explain all his steps. So it got sort of discredited, but that's not really the point. The point is that he, as a psychedelic thinking person, very, very psychedelic sort of a typical example of psychedelic thought, I think, Harris McKenna, was very open to the idea of time flowing both forwards and backwards, because this is representing change through time. So this is representing a backwards time, and the idea of these meshing together just seemed natural to him. It seemed evident that that must, must be the way it was. And when I met him to discuss the problems with his theory, um, at that time, I was just about to set up my retro psycho kidneys project, and he was really into that. He was, you know, we talked very enthusiastically about the idea of the future somehow influencing the past because, or the present, because he saw that we were being pulled into this kind of singularity, that there was this event, this hyperspatial event, he called it, at the end of time. Um, and this acceleration we're seeing with technology and culture and everything, everything just getting more and more complex and dense and interconnected. Um, he saw that as, you know, you could almost track it on a graph and that you could see where it was going to hit the infinity and that's supposed to be uh, here, but it didn't quite work. But, but a lot of it appealed to a lot of people, it appealed to me, the idea, at the time, <coughs> but I wanted to check it out. When I checked it out, I wasn't uh, terribly impressed, but I, I wouldn't dismiss Terence McKenna entirely. I think he has a lot of good stuff to say, or well, he did. And if you don't know him, do, do have a listen, but don't take the time wave stuff seriously. But the reason I brought him into it is simply because he's, a, you know, as I said, a, one of the big, big names of psychedelic thought, and the idea of retro causality seemed perfectly obvious to him. Um, and he promoted this idea of a, a future event pulling us towards it, and that was very popular with the psychedelic community. So there's something going on in terms of psychedelic psychology, the, 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 the psychedelically experienced mind. And these ideas, which, which is an interesting thing, I, perhaps somebody in the psychedelic research community might want to look into. Um, but um, the arrow of time. Now, this is where we get into um, this is the sort of current thinking on, on time, and uh, and whether it, well the idea, the idea that there might be some sort of backwards time effects um, would, would normally fall into this sort of category. That question would be considered. 
within the philosophy of science, uh, not really within science itself, science gets on perfectly well with its equations, but the philosophy around what it all means uh, has arrived at this concept, the arrow of time. Um, so I'll explain what I mean by that. I won't talk about that quite yet. Um, basically, the laws of physics, pretty much, with a couple of exceptions, which are very interesting in, in themselves, um, are the same forwards as backwards. So what, what do I mean by that? Okay, I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Um, I fill the pendulum, a, a well-lubricated pendulum, just swinging. I fill a few seconds of that and I show it to you. Can you tell if the film is going forwards or backwards? Anyone think you can? No. The only way you can tell if it's going forwards or backwards is if the film's long enough that you see it losing its, its, the weight of its swing, because it's running out, its friction is causing it to lose its energy. But if, you, if it's a short film or a very, very perfectly tuned pendulum, you can't tell. Similarly, if I had a pool table with no pockets and I set the balls in motion quite vigorously and filmed that for a few seconds, and you saw all the balls bouncing around and knocking off each other and going all over the place, can you tell if that's forwards or backwards? No, you can't. Because the laws, the, the, the mechanical laws governing these types of things, they're, they're equations, as you, you might not be you know, familiar with what the equations are. <coughs> kind of familiar with the fact that there are equations that, that describe this stuff. And they have a variable t in them, invariably. They have a variable, that's not the right adjective, adverb. Um, they always have a variable t, which represents time, the flow of time. And if you just change the t to a minus t, you get the same system running backwards, and it always works. As I said, in almost every area of physics, it, the laws of physics are the same forwards or backwards. Now, if I throw something in the air and catch it, film that, same thing, you can't tell which way you're seeing that, it's, just, it's totally symmetric. Now, but what about if I dropped a brick on the floor, and I filmed that, and I showed it to you? Yeah, can you tell which way the film's going down? Of course you can. Nobody ever sees a brick suddenly leap into the air into somebody's hand, ever, and yet, that does not violate the laws of physics. There's nothing wrong with that film. If I showed you the backwards version, it could actually physically happen, it just is incredibly improbable. And this isn't some quantum thing, this is, this is just physics, it's just mechanics, this is really basic stuff. Here's how it works. I drop this brick on the floor, gravitational energy causes it to go down, hits the floor, makes a bang, which is sound energy, it's, it's pressure waves in the air. It makes heat, which is, you know, um, molecules jostling about around it on the floor. And it also makes mechanical waves in the floor. It makes the floor vibrate. And you'll see that as the floor were made of something a bit more flimsy. OK. If I show you the film backwards, and the film isn't just like a camcorder thing. It's like a full 3D multi-sensory experience. What you would see is a brick sitting on the floor, me standing like this. And some waves would suddenly come towards the brick. A sound pressure wave would go backwards at the brick. Like it's kind of reverse sound. You'd hear a kind of backwards explosion, um, backwards banging sound. And a load of heat energy would suddenly congregate around the brick. I don't know if energy can congregate, but you get quite in. All of that energy would add up to enough to, and it would be in the right direction if you added up all the vectors, to throw the brick into the air exactly to that height, and I could catch it. So that could happen. It's never going to happen in the history of the universe. The probability of it happening is so small, it's ridiculous, that it doesn't violate the laws of physics. So what's this telling us? We can see a direction in time. If we can watch something long enough, the pendulum swings down to nothing. The balls on the table stop moving. Something falls down. Something runs out of energy. If I mix white and black paint in a bucket and film that, it mixes up into a sludgy colour. If I film that backwards, you never see that sludge separate itself out. But it could. All those molecules can do whatever they want. They can go anywhere. And there's no law of physics to say they can't half that all the white ones can't go over there and all the black ones over there every now and again. If you sat and watched that bucket for eternity, that would happen every now and again. So what this means is that any sense of directionality in time is tied up with probability. And that's a problem because that's kind of a human concept which is constructed on top of time. So here we go. This is the standard stuff you see in thermodynamics, if anyone says. I know there's at least one physics student in here. So this is how they teach you thermodynamics. So we've got some gas in a box represented by some blue dots, which represents loads and loads of molecules. We take the part of them, they're all bouncing around quite vigorously, and we take away the partition. What, what we would expect to find if we went off and made a cup of tea and came back would be something looking like this. Not exactly like that, of course, but just looking kind of random and spread out. Of course it would. Well, there's nothing to say that those blue dots couldn't have all ended up on the other side, or 
just stayed where they were, or it all it's gone into stripes, or spelled out my name. All of these things are possible, but just probability is very small. Because almost, if you made every possible configuration, you made a mathematical description of every possible way that that box could look, where every possible combination of positions was represented, within that would be everything. Some things which would just look silly, like you wouldn't believe that that could happen. But they, they would be in there, there just wouldn't be many of them compared to most, or all of them would look like just a, just a random mess. So if I show you a film of a half a box of gas filling up the box, you think, well, that's obviously going forwards. If I show you a film of a box of gas compressing itself into one of the box, or spelling out something you know, in, in, in uh, Cyrillic, you'd think that's obviously going backwards. That's, you know, that couldn't possibly be the case. Um, but it could. It's just unlikely. Um, and similarly, mixing, that's another, another, uh, that's another way of representing this process. Now, this is the process called entropy. It's, it's, uh, it's a, quite a difficult concept to get your head around. It's, again, sort of philosophy of science, but it does come into thermodynamics. Um, it's kind of things losing structure, things mixing, things going into a state of kind of, sort of maximal randomness. I mean, it's, it's difficult to give you a technical definition, but again, if I separate the partition here, you'd expect the blue and red dots to mix together. Like I said about the buckets, the bucket of two colored paints, they don't unseparate, but they could. Now, Arthur Eddington, um, he was an astronomer. He, came, he was the one who came up with the idea of the arrow of time. And these are the three things he had to say about it. Now, this is, this is fascinating to me, because the first one, okay, we can all see that. We all know about it. We all know which way time's going. You know, I'm, me coming in this room happened before now. It didn't happen. I, um, I was conceived before I was born. You know, you, 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 there's a sense of direction in time. Things happen in, in an order. We all know that. And number two, extends this. We recognize it. We don't just recognize it. We need it in order to think clearly about anything. Again, if you show someone a film of reality backwards, it looks crazy. Um, we just expect there to be a kind of... Well, our reasoning is all based around time going in one particular direction. And that's the direction which ties in with the entropy direction, the things getting <coughs> disordered and mixed and spreading out. That's the direction where things, where the brick falls, it doesn't throw itself in the air. That's the direction that makes sense to our reasoning faculties, he observed. So this is, these aren't scientific observations, really, they're about the mind. And the third one is, again, in a more subtle way, about the mind. It makes no appearance in physical science. There is no arrow of time anywhere. Like I said, all the laws of physics are the same, forwards and backwards, except in the study of organization of a number of individuals. And that's like, okay, a load of molecules and again, a box of gas. A box of gas consisting of a load of molecules. It's a number of individuals. Look, there's lots of molecules. We can count them. They're all roughly the same. But that requires a kind of, there's some sort of overlay of consciousness onto that. That's not looking at things as they are. That's us dividing reality up into, into you know, categories of things and counting them and pointing at them. And Organizing things or understanding things in that way, it's um, it's a bit problematic to in order to, um, to to really pin down precisely what's going on with entropy and and with these sorts of um, attempts to quantify this process which we we, we associate with the directionality of time. Um, it is tied up with some some. Philosophical problems, which I think haven't been properly addressed. But, I mean, there are philosophers of time talking about this sort of thing. But basically, all of the character, all of the uh, characteristics of this arrow of time are to do with us, really. They're to do with our relationship with reality, as opposed to um, something which is actually intrinsic in the universe. If you took us out of the picture, if you took us out of the picture, really, there's, there's no direction. Um, Except you could say there's well, no, there is because the gas fills up the box. It doesn't compress itself. But if there's no one there observing it, it's I haven't really put these thoughts together in a way which is coherent enough to deliver them in a way I'm happy with. But I think you can sense there's something weird going on with this stuff. It's, there's something interesting which hasn't really, I, I don't feel has been really addressed properly. So the thermodynamic arrow of time is the one where things mix up and run out of energy and wind down. And that's, that's the one that we, we associate with common sense. And there's also a cosmological arrow of time in the sense that the universe appears to be expanding as a, as a result of the Big Bang. Uh, that's the current model of reality we've got. So it was a big bang about 15 billion years ago. Is it 13.6? Something like that. So anyway, a long time ago. Uh, everything's still expanding. So if you watch the film of the universe, you say, well, are the ga galaxies expanding or contracting, uh, you know, moving away from each other or towards each other? That gives you a sense of something in a certain direction. That seems to run in the same direction as the entropy. 
And then there's something else with the quantum arrow of time, I'll come back to this. You may have heard of something called the collapse of the wave function, if you've read around any kind of popular account of quantum, quantum physics. And um, that's something which, ha that has a direction, that's, there's a directionality about that. It's something which happens, is the before and an after. Um, but it's, again, it's tied up with epistemology, it's tied up with our, our state of knowledge of the system is part of how it is quantified. I think that's what I was trying to say about the thermodynamics. So all of these things are, well, they're all fascinating to me, but these all line up um, as, as, they're currently, uh, um, as they're currently formulated. They all line up with the psychological arrow of time, the, one, the common sense one. But now let's just look at causality. So here's four definitions. I won't read them out. You can just kind of browse them. Uh, four definitions of causality I found very quickly just looking at some, some, res some respectable online dictionaries. And I grabbed these four, and they all make sense. They're all basically saying the same thing in slightly different or more elaborate ways. Can anyone see the obvious oversight, the thing which is the, the elephant in the room, which is not being observed, uh, which isn't being uh, noted? Think about why, what I'm here talking about. Oh. The cause and effect. It doesn't, there's no sense of direction of time. It doesn't say anywhere that the cause happens before the effect. We take that for granted. We take that for granted to such an extent that the definition doesn't even bother to tell you that. Um, there's nothing in that that suggests that time that, that you couldn't have a cause in the present somehow influence in the past. Um, so that's just an illustration of how embedded the thinking is. That you know, causality is, is a single directional thing. Um, that David Hume, a uh, philosopher in the 18th century, uh, has some very interesting things to say about causality. Now, this isn't his words. This is someone else. So I'm not sure. I've, I can't remember which, which uh, commenter, commentator it, what this was. I should have put in a, um, a reference. But some, they're, they're pointing out that um, the problem with using causality as your sense of the direction of time, so you, know, you knock something off the table, it falls, it breaks. Um, the, I cause this to happen, and therefore time's going that way. Um, the problem is that you can't perceive a causal relation. It's not, it's not a tangible thing. There's just a sequence of events. I, I remember being told about some psychology experiments, again, I, I can't give you references, but where people were presented with sequences of events which were set up very cleverly to look like things were causing other things, but they weren't, they were all separate, independent things. And when someone was asked to describe what happened, they adamantly um, defended the fact that these things were all a sequence of causal, a causal chain of events. That's how we see things. But that's not in the world, that's in our minds. Causality is basically a sort of storytelling device. It's a narrative device. There is no law of causality in physics, really. You have to introduce it yourself. Um, and Hume went on to say, um, it's hard to, you, know, you can't really define what cause and effect really are, and you can't really pin down what they refer to, because any physical event, at, at our level of what I think anthropologists call chunking reality, we break it down into objects which we name, and then we have stories about the relationships between them. In that kind of world, there's sequence of causes and effects, because we're basically in a story. But if you looked at the world as just a swirling mass of fields and particles and energy and matter, you don't see these clear boundaries between things. Everything's just a big fluid that's following seemingly some dynamical laws. So you don't need to chop it up and say, there's the cause, there's the effect. I mean, if you're looking at water flowing around in a, you know, little whirlpools and eddies and things going over rocks, you don't say, oh, that bit of water just caused that to do that. The whole thing's causing everything to do everything else. So Hume basically criticised the idea of causality back in the 18th century, um, but it is the basis for how we see the, the arrow of time. And we're going to come up to retro, we're now coming on to the idea of retro causality. Of course, I had to sneak in uh, Salvador Dali. Now, this, um, Brings us back to this whole psychedelic philosophy thing in that um, Dali, we, as far as we know, he never took uh, psychedelics. He, he, uh, he famously said, um, I don't do drugs, I am drugs. Take me, I am the drug. Take me, I am hallucinogenic. But he also said everyone should eat hashish, but only once. Um, and he shot, he shot a sort of fake documentary with a, with a filmmaker friend about an expedition, to, an expedition to Mongolia in search of giant hallucinogenic mushrooms. So he was certainly interested in these things, but he was painting very trippy art well before the, and he would have had access to any of this stuff. He was just naturally in tune with sort of the dream level of reality. And as a result of that, people on psychedelics, you know, generally sort of go through a Dali phase and they quite like this. But the melting clocks are one of his, if you almost have to pick one image that you associate with him, it's the melting clocks. And what's that about? It's about time being fluid and time not being quite 
um, what you, you're led to believe in a dream, time can kind of go floppy. So here's the, the, um, the persistence of memory, the famous one, and then this is the sort of remix, the, um, well, there's several remixes, but there's the, uh, what's it called, the, col the colored chromosome in the fish's eye initiating the disintegration of the persistence of memory. And, um, and then he's gone into detail with part of it. But it's, um, the, again, the, the fact that people who um, had, had, had exposure to psychedelic consciousness and thinking seem to be quite okay with the idea of time being something more fluid than this rigid, linear thing that we, we're generally educated to think it is. Um, and I'll say more about that. It's some anecdotal uh, accounts of, of responses to these sorts of things among the psychedelic community. But I'm going to talk about a couple of pre-psychedelic thinkers from the 20th century who were very interested in retrocausality. Uh, Luigi Fantapier, I didn't know about it until recently. I was just sort of, I've been revisiting ideas from 20 years ago. I don't talk about this stuff all the time. This is just something I've dredged up from the past. Um, but he's a legitimate Italian mathematician. He created this theory of what are called analytic functional, so it's definitely legit. I don't know much about him, but I know he's not a fraud as a mathematician. Um, his work is you know, completely integrated into higher mathematics. But he came up with this idea of retrocausation. Um, and, um, well, it starts like this. Uh, everyone's seen this equation. It's probably the most famous equation in the world. If you had to name one equation, you'd probably name that one. Uh, so you've all seen that. But you've seen this one. How many people have seen that? Yeah. Uh, now, this one is where that one, that the first one comes from the second one. The second one is derived. <coughs> And then, in uh, the particular context which Einstein was interested in talking about, P being momentum was zero. So this P squared, C squared thing becomes zero, so you can just get rid of it. And you get E squared equals M squared C to the fourth. So don't panic, I'm not going to suddenly start talking about higher maths and physics. Simple stuff. So I basically cross this bit out, and I'm left with that. Now, if you have E squared equals M squared C to the fourth, anyone who's done a bit of maths knows you can take the square root of both sides and get E equals MC squared. But if you're paying attention, you're aware there are two solutions. There's a positive one and a negative one. So say x squared equals 4. Um, you know anything, anything at all about algebra, you know that there's not just one solution in x equals 2. 2 squared is 4, of course. But minus 2 squared is also 4, so it's a plus and minus solution. So Einstein's aware that there's also a minus solution to this equation, um, a negative version, a sort of mirror. But it would involve negative energy. What would that be? A negative mass? And it would also involve things going backwards in time, by implication. So this was obviously nonsense. And he just said, well, then we just ignore that, because that's, you know, that's just a physically impossible thing. And it, it got ignored until Fantapier had a look at it. Because that this was fine until um, he started trying to apply this new relativity theory Einstein had down to quantum mechanical uh, matters, where you have things like electrons spinning close to the speed of light. So you have to start doing E equals MC squared type magic on them. And suddenly, um, this P thing starts to matter. And you've got to go back to this. And the negative time solution suddenly starts to get all tangled up in what you're doing. Um, and I'll say more about this uh, later, about the negative time mirroring um, forward time, backward time waves in quantum mechanics and certain uh, ways of interpreting that. But um, this thing called the Klein-Gordon equation, um, it, it's, it just basically is crying out for a backwards time component which makes sense of a lot of things. Um, but Fantapier could see all this. And so by 1942, he'd written a book called The Unitary Theory of the Physical and Biological World, in which he was arguing that life, life, as in biological life on Earth, is being caused by the future. Now, obviously, a lot of people, well, I would guess a lot of people thought he'd just lost his mind. Life is being caused by the future. But he was thinking like this. Entropy is the thing I was telling you about, where the gas particles all spread out and just become more and more sort of random and disorganized. The thing that allows you to tell which way time's going. And he's like, yeah, that's what you see in most parts of the universe. Everything just kind of disperses and burns <coughs> out and becomes, you know, runs out of energy and wears out and rusts and falls apart. That's the way things go. Um, but there's one area of reality where it's not like that, where things become more and more complex and organized, and that's in bio the biological world. Things have gone from single cells to higher mammals, and those higher mammals are now starting to create civilizations and technologies, and this is the sort of Terence McKenna stuff he loved to go on about this. So we're seeing the opposite of entropy going on in a, in a limited bubble of reality on the surface of the Earth. We're seeing a total reversal of entropy. Now, the, the thermodynamics people wouldn't say, oh, 
that they would say that's not a problem, that's not violating any laws. Um, we can pass this cup around, I think people are going to put stuff in it if you want to just pass the cup around. Um, it's not violating any laws, it's, um, oh, where was I? Someone remind me what was I talking about? Entropy and how biological... Oh yes, yeah, yeah. You, you, you can have a reverse, you can have the opposite of entropy going on locally, um, because it's not a closed system, it's part of a bigger system, and within that, they replace the, the reduced entropy we're seeing, the reduced entropy we're seeing in the biological and social and cultural and technological world, they would say, well, that's been compensated for by gains in entropy that are being you know, created by all this heat that's being let off by these factories and all this pollution and general disorder that's produced. There's, there's some clever arguments which basically tell you there's nothing, it's just a little localised phenomenon that balances out overall, that's the idea. But um, Van Tapier wasn't convinced by that. He came up with the idea of syntropy, which is basically the opposite of entropy. It's a really nice word. You sometimes see the words negentropy and extropy as attempts to kind of come up with the opposite of entropy. He wasn't the only person to think like this. Um, I think various people define it in slightly different ways. And entropy is a tricky one to define. You can define it in terms of boxes of gas, but you can also define it in terms of strings of random numbers. And there are multiple definitions. And there's philosophical debates about where they overlap, so it's a thorny matter. But the general idea is entropy is stuff just thinning out and wearing out and running down, and syntropy is things coming together and organising. Um, and he's saying, okay, most of what's going on in the universe is entropy, and that's been driven by the forwards time laws of physics, if you like, by the forwards time uh, components of the, phys of the mechanics of the physical <laughs> But we're also seeing something which appears to, be, appears to be being pulled from the future. And life is being caused by the future, is what he said. The, the syntropy we're seeing is being caused by mirrored, mirroring laws of physics, effectively, ones which mirror the, the entropy generating ones. Um, and uh, another, another person around the same time, well, he was he'd born earlier, but died around the same time, he was pushing similar ideas. Now, again, I'm not endorsing any of this, it's interesting to know what's out there. Um, Jesuit priest. And a geologist, paleontologist, and philosopher, uh, Pelar de Chardin. Um, he came up with the idea of this thing called an omega point. And Terence McKenna had, you know, um, owed quite a lot to this idea. Uh, McKenna was interested in, in a lot of different types of eschatology, but he was aware of this omega point idea. And it was basically a melding of theolo Catholic theology with Darwinian evolution in a way which basically upset both the reductionist biological, uh, or reductionist biologists like Richard Dawkins being you know, the classic example, um, was seen as a charlatan by the, by the hard real scientists. Um, but also, um, no, he wasn't excommunicated, I don't think, by the Vatican, but his books were removed from Catholic libraries by order of the Pope. Um, because he, he basically bridged uh, theology and um, bridge theology and, and evolution theory in an interesting way. And he, he basically said, okay, so we are seeing evolution, the evidence is showing it, let's not deny it, we're seeing cells, you know, becoming multicellular and evolving into these higher organisms, and then us. And he basically saw an evolution that went beyond biological evolution from um, primordial particles to the de development of life, human beings, and the noosphere, that's the whole kind of web of human communication. And um, this idea that we're going from a geosphere to a biosphere into consciousness in, in humans, and then onto some sort of supreme consciousness, and this is where it gets religious, this idea of this, almost like we're creating God as some future point or something like this, or God is something in the future pulling us towards a state of perfection. He was pushing a really kind of, almost like a sci-fi theology, it's quite cool if you're, if, you're, you know, if you're able to stomach Catholic theology, it's among the kind of, the, the uh, most psychedelically compatible. Um, and, uh, and now, now we leap ahead into the second half of the 20th century, and here are three people that definitely are psychedelically experienced, or were. Uh, Terence McKenna's gone now, 2000 he passed away. Rupert Sheldrake, Sheldrake's still around, and some of you I'm sure know about him. He's, he's a kind of radical biologist. McKenna is a sort of maverick, psychedelic enthusiast. And Ralph Abraham was a, a dynamical systems theorist, a physicist who was one of the pioneers of chaos theory in California back in the 60s, and he did some very serious research, um, made some real breakthroughs, and he's uh, one of the very few people, interestingly, in the mathematical sciences that I'm aware of who's openly psychedelically experienced, or at least he was when I used to be interested in that kind of thing. Um, probably now there's a younger wave of, of uh, you know, people who aren't, aren't prepared, who are, who are trying these things and not afraid to tell people. 
But back, back in the 90s, there was no one else apart from Ralph Abraham. And these three were friends, and they used to get together and have these three-way conversations, which are great to listen to, because they all kind of listen and they all respond in interesting ways. Um, Trialogues at the Edge of the West and Trialogues at the Edge of the Unthinkable were published as books of, of uh, transcripts. And there's also loads of audio, um, give you some idea. There they are. Um, on, on Sheldrake's site, there's, there's, you can listen to, you know, you can see some of the topics. So it's a bit 90s, there's uh, crop circles and fractals. And, um, but, you know, there's, there's some good stuff. They're all, you know, they're all, I, I'm not endorsing any of these people as, as to be absolutely, uh, everything that they say should be believed or taken seriously. But um, they've all got interesting things to say. They're all psychedelically experienced, and they all were interested in and um, were actively interested in in their research in this idea of retrocausality. So we've seen how McKenna was with his time wave um, and his 2012 thing calling us into the future. Um, and Sheldrake, he's um, interested in <coughs> morphology, embryology, the way things form. Um, and so one of the things he's pointed out is that when you have uh, creatures conceived, they begin as a single cell and then they multiply into multiple cells and then they start to, you know, certain bits appear or bits and parts. Um, the, the standard model we're given for, the, the metaphor we're given for how, what's going on is a sort of mechanism, it's like a, more like a computer code. The DNA is the code, and there's like the software that's been run, and the hardware is the protein molecules, and it builds this amazing thing. Problem is, if you've ever written any computer code, you know that if someone goes in and messes with a few lines, it's not like you run and you, get, you run the program and you get pretty much the right output. No, the slightest change of a semicolon messes the whole thing up. So the idea is, some kind of nasty, not necessarily nasty, but a certain type of scientist I probably wouldn't be able to relate to. The type that, you know, take things which are grow and cut bits off to see what will happen. I mean, you know, you learn things that way, but it's a really appeal. But what, we, what, we, what Sheldrake's interested in is the way that you can, you can basically interfere with developing organisms, cut bits off and stick things in them and restrict them. Unfortunately, the, best, the pictures I've got aren't the best examples. But they seem to find a way around it. They seem to find a way of developing a full organism, you know, in some reduced way, perhaps. But they don't just go horribly wrong. If you, if you, if you do enough damage, they will. But it's a surprising amount of sort of self-regulation. You can kind of knock it off its normal track and it kind of rebalances itself. And similarly with behavior. So Sheldrake loves these examples of these very simple creatures, these wasps, brains the size of a pinhead. Um, and they dig tunnels, they lay eggs, or they, lay, they yeah, hatch these larvae, um, and then they build these partitions and they put food in, in, in sort of cells for them to gradually eat on their way out. And then they build this trumpet at the end to stop other predatory creatures getting in. Um, and people have, you know, again, in a sort of slightly, I mean, it's not malevolent, but, you know, people coming along and not breaking them to see what will happen. Um, you, you break them off and they just come back and keep rebuilding them. You know, they just keep doing that until they run out of energy. But interestingly, if you make a hole here, they just come back and start building from that hole. And you might think, well, that's not hugely... Uh, um, but if you think about something, a brain that small is able to adapt. So it's a, first of all, it's able to know how to build something like that. We're told that uh, a code, um, you know, which is actually not, there's not that much of it. I mean, we've got less genes than a rice plant. And DNA, as Sheldrake likes to point out, basically just codes for proteins. I mean, there's more, it is more subtle than that. There are genetic activation mechanisms going on that can allow for some pretty amazing stuff to happen in terms of how those proteins arrange themselves. But in terms of a behavior of a wasp, you know, being able to basically improvise around a semi-destroyed structure that is built. Sheldrake's, uh, he's, he's come up with lots, but those are just two, as I said, not particularly good examples, not striking examples, of um, something that you can, Visualize using this, this kind of metaphor, what he calls creos. So it's as if the evolutionary, these evolutionary pathways are like grooves in this downward sloping surface, and a ball rolls down a groove. If you knock it slightly on its way down, it will roll around a bit, but it's going to end up in the same place. It will regulate itself. Gravity is, is doing that in this case. But if you knock it hard enough, of course, it's going to go up over the edge and into another groove. And this kind of creos based thinking is you know, it's quite helpful for understanding things. The two things you can say about it, one is that it's suggesting things are kind of being pulled from the future into a particular kind of template or shape. Another one is, well, where is that? What is that? What's the substance of this thing? Well, what reality has it got? Now, those are huge questions, but um, Sheldrake's done some, I think, really brilliant work and raised, well, mainly raised really interesting questions about things which 
seemingly can't explain mechanistically. But interestingly, he's taken psychedelics, and a lot of what he's saying in his latest book, The Science Delusion, which I'd highly recommend, um, he points out that, um, well, he argues that a lot of the things going on in, in embryology and morphology indicate something like a, um, a combination of mechanistic forward time processes, so cells dividing, meta things metabolizing and dividing and, and uh, combining in various ways. Um, but there's also something else seemingly put these like these creodes, it's just a mental model that we've got at the moment. Something's in the future, you could think of it as some kind of idealized form of the thing. But again, what is that? Pulling it towards that future state. So you give it a bit of a knock this way or that when it's on its way. If it's got enough, if there's a deep enough groove, it's still going to get there. So McKenna, Sheldrake, both into retroclosality. Ralph Abraham, um, I, I discovered he credits DMT for swerving his career towards a search for the connections between mathematics and the experience of the logos, which is, you could argue, the sort of the, literally means the word, but sort of the universal mind. Um, so he's, he's a psychedelic mathematician. Um, someone's pointed out he looks exactly like Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead, who's a psychedelic musician in Northern California. Uh, very much from the same era and part of the same world. So he was kind of like, you know, he was a psychedelic physicist, the, the archetypal one, and he was, he liked hanging out with Sheldrake and McKenna and chatting about all kinds of stuff. Um, but he, he was coming out, he was developing mathematics to describe dynamical systems which didn't fit into normal classical models, what's now called chaos theory, and a lot of it's based around these things called attractors. You've probably seen these because they're quite beautiful and they end up on magazine covers, but a lot of people don't really know what they're looking at, but they're lovely. But they're basically describing, they're, they're what are called face portraits. They're showing the evolution of a system. That could be anything. It could be a billion table or a box of gas or you know, a quantum mechanical oscillator. But basically you're tracking the behavior, the behavior of something by representing it at a point moving in space and it carves out these lines so you can see um, something beautiful it might just be a dripping tap, and you can still get these beautiful attractors. And the simplest way to understand an attractor would be a, a marble in a, in a bowl, pudding basin. You drop a marble in, rolls around, what does it do? It ends up at the bottom. You spin it sideways, it goes round and round. What happens? It ends up at the bottom. Whatever you do, whatever path it takes, however interesting, it's always going to end up at the same place. And that's the simplest possible and very boring, most boring example is what it ends up with. It's just a, marble at the bottom of a bowl, um, a more complex system can settle into a kind of attractor where basically it, it can do all kinds of things at the beginning, but something seems to pull it into this groove where it then just stays in that groove. That's a very, very rough explanation of what attractors are, but hopefully it gives you some sense of it. And it gives you some idea as to why a psychedelic physicist who's working with this stuff might think, maybe there's something in the future kind of pulling the system into it. So he's open to the idea of retrocausation. And he's been more recently, I discovered, again, this is all, it's only because Timmy asked me to give a talk, but I know this stuff, so it's, I'm very grateful. Thank you for inviting me, by the way. Um, that was very rude of me not, so thank you at the beginning, so sorry. Um, uh, <coughs> physicist from India, Sisir Roy, and he had been um, getting quite mystical, but it, you know, they, they know their physics. And they're talking about something before space-time, like a kind of what they call an ether, they're taking an old word, theological kind of term, but they're describing some pre-space-time something which kind of self-organizes itself into space-time. Really far out idea, very psychedelic kind of physics. But notice the last sentence, with special emphasis on the illusion of time, the apparent paradoxes such as precognition, retrocausation, and entanglement. Now at this stage, of course, if you're a skeptical type who's never done psychedelics and doesn't really want to and thinks that basically they're just something which distort your understanding of things. You could easily say, well, all, clearly all of these examples of these people I've given are people who just don't even need drugs and gone a bit crazy and this stuff's ridiculous. And uh, yeah, that's fair enough. But check this out. Um, the, you know, is this real? This is the point where people are saying, okay, it's all very far out. You know, is, it, is it real? Um, Dick Beerman, Dean Radin. Now, these are among the most respectable psychos parapsychologists there are in terms of you know, their experimental methods and their years of experience and the, the rigor with which they go through, basically all the hoops you have to jump through to publish parapsychology research. It's much easier to get a drug on the market, honestly. You, know, you are subject to the most ridiculous levels of scrutiny. Because there's an ideological, I basically, battle to, to push down any such ideas, it appears. Um, but. Uh, here we, here, here we have some very respectable, um, I believe, uh, researchers. 
who came up with this very simple idea. I think Radin started it, and then Vim and sort of executed it later. Um, this was published in a, in a journal, quite unpretentious journal of perceptual and motor skills, not in a parapsychology journal. Um, it works like this. Um, you take people and you hook them up to a, a polygraph, like a lie detector, and that measures the um, skin resistance on your fingers, which is linked to how much you're sweating. And that's how it works. If you lie, the little jolt goes through you, if you, unless you're a psychopath. And then um, you can pick that up, basically, electronically, and, and uh, detect these little spikes in people's anxiety levels. So the idea is you take a um, collection of images, say 100 images, 90 of them are just innocuous household objects and pictures of trees and birds and things. And 10 of them are shocking. They're violent, they're pornographic, they're maybe horrible medical images of diseases and wounds and things. Things that would make you sit up in your chair. Um, and the, there's a computer hooked up to you with your polygraph, and it's got a clock, it's measuring everything to the millisecond. Um, and it beyond the millisecond, probably. And it's randomly, it's, it's the, the methodology is like this. Um, you have a blank screen for 7.5 seconds, computer randomly selects a photo, shows it for three seconds, and then you get 10 more seconds of blank. So you're basically sitting there waiting for the next image. It's either going to be really shocking or just boring. And if you get, what would you expect to see on the graph? You'd expect to see um, that after, um, after the event, you would see a spike. Um, in the, this, is, this is a shocking image and this is a calm image. So you get a little bit of a bump when you see anything, just because it's like, oh, there's a picture on the screen. Um, but if it's, if it's shocking, you get a bigger spike. Now that's what you'd expect, but what you see over here is that the shocking image creates noticeably higher levels of activity before it appears than, our, than the calm image. Um, that's the gap. Now you might think, well, it's not much of a gap, but it's, it's a perceptible gap that persists over many, many, many runs. Um, it's statistically hugely significant. And it, what's going, nobody knows the sequence of these images. It's not like someone sitting there in a lab who knows what the next picture is going to be, who's giving out signals. They, nobody knows. The computer doesn't even know when that starts happening, when, when this, the, the, um, the stimulus is there. So this is going on before the computer even knows what the image is going to be. Not the computers know anything, but you know what I mean. Before the image is being generated, so what's going on? It's like the, um, it's as if the event, the shocking <coughs> image is causing an event, it's influencing you before you see it. Now anecdotally, a lot of people, I think, just if you just had a chat about this, I can't leave people. I think a lot of people might admit that anecdotally, they, they kind of feel like this has happened to them, if they can relate to this idea, and that if someone's just about to knock over a beautiful vase or something, there's a sort of, just a moment of dread, perhaps, before you even see the movie. You know, obviously, if you see them about to knock it over, but just before things happen, sometimes there's a sort of little ripple of something, recognition. I found it tuning up guitars and stringed instruments. I don't know if any of the guitarists could, 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 could hear, but um, often when you break a string, you often break, well, broken strings often occur while tuning, and I found that when I break a string, it always feels like a few, well, some small fraction of a second before it broke, I knew it was going to break, but I, I couldn't, I didn't have long enough to put the brakes on with my muscles, so it was, you know, broke it. So it's as if the shock of the breaking string sends a ripple backwards through time. Now, I used to go on about that to people, and it sounded insane, but this evidence, this, these, this, this experiment suggests that's actually probably exactly what's happening, in that a string breaking is a shocking event. And the simplest way of thinking about this is, if you throw a stone into a pond, this is the mental image I tend to use, throw a stone in a pond, you will see ripples moving away from you as a result of that splash. The splash is a, a shocking event. <coughs> but you will also see ripples coming towards you. But the problem is we have, we have a psychological framework and we have language structures which conform very nicely with the idea of the ripples going that way, which have made very little sense of the ripples coming this way, if there are any, and it looks like there are. Um, they're, they're, they're muted, they're not as extreme, but they're there. And it's possible, um, because we haven't got words for them, we, we can't really talk about them, we, we sort of block them out. Although there is, you know, and again, anecdotally, people talk about precognition, various types, sensing things, uh, you know, a sense of dread of something about to happen. And then, of course, you've got long-term stuff and prophecy and things like this, which, again, it's all, all tied up with this, but, um, 
the, the Beerman gradient stuff is a serious research of you know very precise effects. It, 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 talking about 300 millisecond type envelopes and things. Um, but they published it as um, an almost unconscious emotional responses, evidence for a reversal of the arrow of time. So these are scientists seriously suggesting some kind of reversal of the arrow of time. And this was presented at um, one of the third in the series in the 90s of um, down in Arizona con consciousness conferences. People from all different disciplines, psychologists, philosophers, physicists, and, and mystics all getting together and talking about consciousness. And they presented this backwards time idea. Um, now, psychedelically speaking, I, I don't know uh, Raiden. Um, I, 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 I did email him for a while. We were communicating when I was doing that retro psychokinesis project. He was very helpful and friendly. He plays the banjo. Um, but uh, Dick Beerman presented some of his research on the effects of THC and psilocybin on precognition at the MAPS, that's, um, if you didn't know, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, at their conference in 99. So he, he hasn't done psychedelics himself. He's administered the people in the lab and gone to a conference for the people talking about them. So he's obviously quite comfortable in that world. Um, so we have, again, a uh, sort of compatibility of psychedelic thought and the acceptance of the reversal of an arrow of time. Now, um, how are we doing for time, Timmy? Can I go on for another five? I don't know. Does anybody have time or not? Yes, is that right? 2017. <coughs> um, yeah, we've got time. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is John Kramer, and uh, I'll let him introduce himself for a few seconds. It's always nice to hear somebody's voice. Right. So, hello. Okay. Hi, I'm John Kramer. I'm a professor at the University of Washington. Uh, and in the 1980s, uh, I invented an alternate version, uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's called transactional interpretation. And the basic idea behind it is that if. Right. We won't get into the basic idea behind it yet. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll run you through this in my own words, but he's um, so he's sitting outside a conference here. Unfortunately, you can't hear him that well, but he just introduced himself and got the basic idea. He's come up with a thing called the transactional interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, and the idea is that if you look at, as I said, I hinted earlier when I mentioned Luigi Fantapier, if you look at the, the quantum mechanical, or the relativistic version of quantum mechanics, you're combining Einstein's relativity ideas with the quantum mechanics that was emerging around the same time. Um, you get something called the Klein-Gordon the Klein -Gordon equation, and it's got a negative time solution, which is usually ignored. And it can be interpreted, um, basically you can interpret that the weirdness, if you heard about these sort of quantum paradoxes and weirdnesses, I'm sure a lot of you heard of Schrodinger's cat, uh, the two-slit experiment, maybe you've heard about spooky action as in distance, or um, quantum entanglement, maybe if you've read around this stuff a bit more, Bell's theorem. Um, non-locality. There are all these problems, these paradoxes and problems with quantum mechanics and things which don't kind of make sense. The maths all works, but in terms of interpreting it, it it's, there are problems. Now, the mainstream interpretation is the Copenhagen interpretation, which was um, Heisenberg, uh, make sure I don't get this wrong. Um, I don't know my, my quantum mechanical history. I was Schrodinger and Heisenberg in the 20s in Copenhagen basically came up with the standard interpretation of what's going on. Now, the thing, the thing at the center of the problem is called the wave function. Again, I'm going to breeze through this. Don't try and, you know, I'm not going to try and teach you quantum mechanics in five minutes. Particles, as you may have heard, sometimes appear to behave like waves. And they're not waves moving through space. They're probability waves in a mathematical hyperspace. And there's a thing called the collapse of the wave packet. And that happens when you measure something. So a particle exists as this kind of evolving wave in this abstract space. But when you observe it, you say, hang on, but where is it? When you look, you find it somewhere, and at that moment, the wave literally collapses down. I um, don't know why I used the word literally. I think it's all you young people are <laughs> That was completely unnecessary use of the word literally. Um, this collapse of the wave function gives us a quantum arrow of time. There's a sense of before, as I said, there's before and there's an after. Um, but what's going on with this collapse? Why is, it, why is an observer observing something causing it? And this, cause the new age crowd to get really excited. It's like, oh look, consciousness has a role in physics and we can shape the world because the wave packets collapse when we observe them. Um, physicists hated the kind of new age quantum mysticism, which was usually based on a false understanding of it. But their explanation, their Copenhagen interpretation, wasn't really helping because a lot of the uh, paradoxes were still problematic, particularly to do with non-locality. Um, and their, their interpretation was, it was quite 
clever. They basically said this wave, this evolving wave function, it's not actually anything tangible. It just represents the state of knowledge of the observer. So if you don't know where something is, it's just in this kind of vague, wavy sort of state of indeterminacy. When you measure and find out where it is, that wave representing your knowledge suddenly goes down to a point because you know where it is. Before, you don't know, now you do. So they say nothing's really collapsing. You're not actually influencing the universe. It's just a representation of your knowledge state. But it doesn't cut, you know, what's the expression, cut the mustard? In the it's not good enough. It's, um, there are still problems. And Kramer comes along in 86 and comes up with a beautiful interpretation of quantum mechanics which involves waves coming from the future interacting with waves going forwards through time. So there's what's called a uh, retarded wave going forwards, which is a bit counterintuitive, and then there's the advanced wave coming forward. So if you look, he claims, if you look at a star 200 light years away, that wave has traveled 200 years to get to your eye and hit your, your cornea and register as light. But at the same time, well, somehow a signal, a, a retard, an advanced wave has traveled backwards in time 200 years from your eye to the star um, and inter interacted with the atom, the nuclei of the atom produced that original photon. He, he describes it as a handshake. It's a handshake between these forward and backwards waves. Now it might sound wacky, but it is actually completely, completely, perfectly conforms to the mathematics and it makes perfect sense. It makes everything really easy. He teaches quantum mechanics at Washington University with this approach. There's no problem, there's no paradox. You just have to accept that there's something coming backwards through time. And as a result, he's got no traction with this at all outside a small group of people like me, I suppose. There's the Klein-Gordon equation with its negative time solutions. Um, this is a, from a PowerPoint of his, and there he is, reverse, reverse causation and the transactional interpretation. So he's very much interested in re reverse causation. He talked at a conference called Frontiers of Time, um, and that video I showed you is him outside the, uh, the lecture hall of this symposium in San Diego about building starships. And you've got some big time science fiction writers and some serious heavyweight scientists all getting together to talk about whether we're going to be building starships and whether we should be. And he was there because he's, um, well, I'll, I'll give you an example of the kind of stuff he likes talking about. Because basically, this has got him thinking about time travel in a serious way. Um, I mean, there, this is him uh, from one of his PowerPoints. I think he's quite amused by the fact he's on the front of a gentleman's magazine, the one credible scientist actively trying to crack that ultimate frontier, the fourth dimension. Um, but he seems like a nice bloke, and he's used the melting clocks on his, uh, on his PowerPoint as well, like I did on my Retro Psychokinesis project page. So it seems to be the thing. And he points out that this supposed law of causality is not really a law, it's something we build into the world. Uh, causes must precede effects. But you know, there's violations of it in quantum mechanics. You can set up an experiment where clearly the cause happens afterwards. Um, and uh, I'm not going to talk about him. He's, he's, there's another there's another physicist into retro causality. He's into something called chronotopology. I could go on about him. And he's allegedly had a shamanic initiation thing that he set up involving administering psychedelics to people. But it's all a bit a bit uh, hearsay, so I won't go on about that. But, Where am I not talking about? Uh, reaching the stars by, by accelerating a whirlpool to the high of very high velocities and shooting with the stars and use a relativistic time dilation to get there almost instantaneously. So you fly through the wormhole? Uh, you, you send the, send the wormhole there, send momentum bearing particles through it to steer it uh, around and goes yeah. where you want it, you land it, and then you expand it and get out and I see. Uh, <laughs> and how much energy does that take? Uh, <laughs> nobody knows. <laughs> anyway, this is the kind of thing he likes talking about, time travel. Go, getting, I love this, getting to the start, like firing wormholes at them, not trying to go through the wormhole, throw the wormhole at the start. And he's using serious physics. He's writing what's called hard science fiction. Now, it's like science fiction that doesn't bend the rules, that actually looks at the physics and says what could possibly happen. Um, and he's hanging around with, like I said, some, you know, it's very heavyweight physicists and science fiction writers talking about building starships and throwing wormholes around. I, I think he's probably a little bit old to have been involved in the psychedelic revolution, but he seems to be quite compatible with it. Uh, that kind of thinking, I imagine, um, would appeal more to somebody psychedelically experienced than somebody not. But again, I don't want to make this distinction between sort of the sheep and the goats. I know some very rigidly minded people who've done lots of psychedelics who would, who would uh, you know, ridicule, well, ridicule this, but would critique it. Um, and I know people who uh, have never taken anything who'd be completely open to this. So that's an important point. Uh, I don't want anyone to feel left out. Um, and uh, finally, um, so what, what we look with the sort of paradoxes that um, 
that Wheeler likes talking about uh, involve things like this, tachyons and time reversal paradoxes. So you have something accelerating towards the speed of light firing these particles and they end up sending signals backwards through time. There's a thing called um, uh, tachyonic anti-telephone. I love this. Uh, I'll try hang on. It's a thing, it's a hypothetical device for sending signals back into your own past. And it, again, it's this, if you allow certain things in quantum mechanics, you end up with fast than light signals, which allow things to go backwards in time. Um, so I'm going to end on a joke. This is, a, a, as far as I know, the only psychedelic physics joke. Um, why did the tachyon cross the road? It was a um, <laughs> and why did the chicken cross the Murphy's strip? It's already on the same side. Right, I'll shut up now. Thank you. <laughs>
probably argue it's not around anymore that, that you again you can't make a clear distinction between what's you know between cause and reverse cause. It's, it's just one kind of continuum. Yeah. Um, all of this sort of direction of time, you kind of um, had to. It's something we do. There's mm -hmm. something that you have in there uh, earlier on with the arrow of time and stuff. And I know, sort of, uh, if you take sort of Einstein's stuff to its logical conclusion, that that time itself is a dimension, like right and left, and it's already yeah, it's established. Right yeah. So there's a block universe type thing that's already there. It's a four-dimensional block. It's yeah. got everything in it. There's no sense yeah. of an arrow. There's no right. time goes that way. It's any more than right. this. This line goes that way. That line doesn't go either way. It's just the line. Yeah. Right. And right so, way. I mean, all of this sort of description about sort of time flowing in a certain direction is kind of ignoring that that's already sort of placed earlier in your talk, that that's just us perceiving it. Yes, it, it, somehow our brain, our consciousness seems to experience something like riding along this line mm -hmm. in a unidirectional way. Mm -hmm. um, and you could say, well, you know, if, if you were to look at this four-dimensional block, I mean, uh, people might not be familiar with what I'm talking about. Once you say four-dimensional, people go all kind of sci-fi. It's a quite simple mathematical idea where if I'm actually, imagine I had a, a, a pool table and I had a camera on the ceiling and I, I, I filmed um, every fraction of a second I took a uh, shot of this table that someone was playing pool and I printed out all the, um, every single image on a giant transparent or a life-size transparency so you could just see the balls, not the felt. And I stacked them all on top of each other in order. You would see the history of each ball's movement around the table as a kind of geometrical sort of diagonally spiral up the thing. If it stayed, if the ball stayed put the whole game, it would just be a column. If it bounced around a lot, it would be that. If it went in a pocket, it would just disappear. Um, but you could look at any ball and just say, oh yeah, so that ball started there and it bounced off that ball then, and then it ran into that one, and then it went in that pocket. So the whole history of the game, which is the metaphor for the universe, is in this block. Now, if you had a 2D universe, a pool table, effectively, the, you know, the, the configuration is the 2D thing. We're in a 3D configuration, so we have the time in as a fourth dimension, we end up with a 4D block. You can't picture that, but imagine taking a photograph of a 3D photo, a big gelatinous cube photo of the universe. It's got everything in it, but it's all transparent somehow. So you have to probably have taken some drugs to really do this properly. Um, and then you stack all of these 3D gelatinous blocks somehow together, but not blocks on top of blocks, but you like stack them kind of all inside each other, somehow all nested, all lined up against each other in some other dimension. It makes this 4D thing. In the same way, you've got every single object in the universe and its, its, its history is there as a pump. So you start off as a single cell when you're conceived, and then you expand into an embryo and a baby and a toddler and an old person, and then you disintegrate in a coffin. Um, and you, so you're a continuous sort of conical sort of wavy thing. Um, it's not the right word. It's a Time thing. worm, I've heard it called. Time worm, yeah. yeah. Um, in the same way that if you took a, uh, a time-lapse photo of me walking across the room, you left the shutter open, I mean, mm -hmm. and I walk across the room, um, you'd see me as a kind of long blur. It's like a 3D version of that. And so, if you buy into Einstein in space-time, the, the space-time continuum is your basic framework for the, for the universe, it's just all there. The whole thing's happened in, in a sense that you're just basically saying it's all predestined. Um, but then you get into problems with that, and then there are problems with interpreting quantum mechanics, and you've probably all heard about the parallel universes interpretation, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. So there's a possibility that, there's poss that the universe isn't just one track, that there's a forking of the time track. But, it, but then when you hear about that, when you hear about time forking, it's always forking in one direction. You know, it's like you're walking along the time continuum, you think, shall I do this or shall I do that? It's never forking the other way. You never have different histories converging on the same present. But this stuff, well, the um, retro-psychokinesis stuff, got me thinking back then that there might be multiple, there might be multiple pasts. This was like one of my most heretical ideas. I think some of my friends didn't think I was going a bit crazy. Um, they just, we all take it for granted that there might be multiple futures. You know, it's like, well, I could do this, I could do that, and then you make these decisions and everything happens differently. And we often muse on, I wonder what would have happened if I hadn't done that. Or, so that we, we see this as this fanning out. And I imagine, well, imagine we're walking through the woods and then you come to paths and they're walking. And you, you do. But imagine you're walking back, you're on your way back to try and get back to where you left your bike or whatever, you're walking along the path. 
And that's fine because it's been forking like this so that you're always going to get funneled back to where you came from. But what if as you were walking along you didn't notice there was a path coming up behind you that joined your path? So you're going back, you know, oh no, did I come from this way or that way? So again, I have this idea of different histories that arrive at the same path, the same present, and that you can't know what your past was necessarily. When you attempt to measure that, it, it, well, it, I, I sort of tried to tie this into quantum mechanical ideas. And my idea was with the retro-psycho-kinesis stuff is that the past, those small parts of the past which are unobserved are basically up for grabs because there are lots of pasts all converging on the present and just as there are lots of futures. So I saw it rather than a time as an endlessly forking line, I saw it as just this continually sort of, well, just this permanent nexus of direct things coming in from both past and future. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, I don't know if I believe what, it's not really a matter of belief, it's just, it's just a model, it's just a kind of sci-fi scenario really that I, I amused myself with. Um, but uh, is that what I just asked? Well, I mean, it, it answers it for me. It makes that block universe the most easy and uh, uh, sort of what are the parsimonious way to sort of deal with retro causality mm -hmm. because all these other branching stuff makes it far too complex to explain. Yeah. Um, but if you, if you buy into just a 14 block, then you are accepting, you know, the completely deterministic set of laws. Yeah, which I don't, but... <laughs> yeah, but you can see, you know, it'd be interesting to try and relate, you know, the issues of determinism and free will to questions of entropy and retro mm. I haven't really thought about that. I, know, I haven't thought about a lot of this for years, and right. I've sort of dug it all out again. Um, Do you believe that consciousness creates, then? Consciousness creates? Um, I, yeah, well, I'd say that my general sort of suspicion about the world is that we're let, we've been educated to think that, con that matter is the main thing, the world's made of matter and consciousness is some sort of extra thing that comes out of that, what gets called an ecto phenomenon. So matter gets organized in a particular way and you end up with consciousness as a product occasionally when you get a higher life form involving more. So you've so got consciousness inside matter, a, or inside the world of matter you've got this phenomenon called consciousness. And it occurred to me that well, maybe it's the other way around, maybe matter is a phenomenon of consciousness, you know, because ultimately any access I have to it is through my mind. Whatever, however I formulate it or model it or think about it, it's basically my mind organizing itself into a certain way. And, and we share information about how the world works through swapping equations and models, and it's all mental constructs. So I started thinking, what if physical matter is an epic phenomenon of consciousness? And it, really, I think you can look at it either way or both ways, and that the two are sort of co-creating in some way. Um, maybe that's that. That's just that's just really new age nonsense. In all ways to say, but I, I, I think I think well, first of all, I don't think we have no idea what consciousness is, and I think um, it's got a much more expansive and uh, mysterious role in the world than it's generally believed to. So to say it creates, I'd say I, I think I know what you're talking about, and I think I agree with you. So. Um, I'm just going to say that the thing we were talking about earlier about uh, consciousness creating phenomena, mm -hmm. I would say it's not necessarily just part of the new world perspective. Kant is very, very within that sort of a, a ballpark. He says specifically time. Mm -hmm. I think he would say forwards time, but I don't think it's much of a concept of reverse time. He mm -hmm. would say it's a predicate for all existence ideas. Was it one of his, what did he call them? They were the basic... Um, a priori. The a priori. So yeah. one of those? Yeah, yeah. So time was so like you could never imagine any action or any idea unless you had a specific amount of time. Yeah, for it to the duration happen. within which it occurred. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but reverse time could work the same way. I'm yeah. saying that could just be two sides of the same coin. He's saying, look, these are both a priori predicates for yeah. existence. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, because he was, he was actually, one of his eight priorities had to be binned with the discovery of non-Euclidean geometry in the 19th century, because he basically took Euclidean ge geometry as one of his categories, and then Lobachevsky and, and Boilei and others came along and showed that there are other models. So, you know, that was one of the rare instances where a philosopher was proved wrong <laughs> by a physicist, because, you know, normally it, things are fuzzy enough that you can still kind of prop them up, but that was wrong. So you could, I mean, I think you would you'd need to just sort of slight upgrade or can't say prioritize to include a retro causation. Um, but there's a question as to like, causation seems, I mean, it's like the, as I said, that when you look at the pre the best, for me, the best evidence that this is something which is real and going on and affecting us at some level um, is, is the pre-sentiment data, you know, the, the spike that appears before the picture shows up. But it's a muted spike, so it's not as if, you know, it's as if the forward time half of the picture is, is more dominant, the backward time is getting muted. And Dick Beerman, one of the two, the Dutch one on that team, did the pre 
he's published a model of um, consciousness. Well, that might have it, have it with me. Um, yeah, he, he's recently, you know, thinking, you know, basically someone who's been to psychedelic research conferences, done parapsychology research for years, and his new paper, Consciousness Induced Restoration of Time Symmetry, a Psychophysical Theoretical Perspective. And he's basically arguing that um, starts from the assumption that information processing by a brain, while it is sustaining consciousness, so supposedly all of us right now, is restoring the break in time symmetry in physics. And I still, still don't quite understand what he's doing, and I won't read any more, but I mean, out loud. Um, but he's basically, I think he's suggesting that time, it looks like the laws of physics should be symmetrical, you know, because like I said, they're all forwards and backwards, and yet there's a kind of break in that symmetry, because there's this thermodynamic error of time. And there's this process that's kind of trying to work against that. It's a reversal of that, or it's an attempt to sort of iron that back out again. Um, and when we see that bump mirroring the bigger bump, that's a physical neurological trace of some process of this. I don't really get it, to be honest. I've, I've printed this thing out, and there's like words in handy. I'm going to have this yeah, in time. But, um, the retro, the concept of, yeah, he, do, he talks about his retro psychokinesis experiments in here, and then about, um, Retro uh, or pre-sentiment, but you know, there's sections in here. Time paradoxes, does time symmetry imply retro causation? This kind of thing. So yeah, there's a body of, of interesting literature if you you know if you know where to look about this kind of thing. Um, by as I see reputable scholars, although of course there are always going to be people that take the full line, um, and uh, you, you have to sort of use some discernment because it's, it's a very murky area. So if you look, in some of the people I mentioned, if you were to look them up on Wikipedia when you got home, you think, oh, well, actually, they can't be something a total fraud. But totally, you know, they're really sloppy, not proper scientists, and we'll look at what this person said about them. Look at all these references. And there's an there are teams of people, and there's the psychop, the um, concerned scientists investigating claims of the paranormal, who organize people to form teams of editors and basically denigrate anyone that they deem an enemy of reason which is a very limited concept, as far as I can see, so clinging on to this consensus reality. I mean, there's the skepticism is good, don't get me wrong, I'm going to just probably believe in any old nonsense, but all, as Sheldrake points out, when you've got organized skepticism, it's really not much different from organized religion. You know, if you're really skeptical, be a skeptic on your own, you know, um, think for yourself. So, well, yeah, Rupert Sheldrake came to speak at Christchurch. See you, Kirsty. Thanks for coming. I'll see you um, uh, Sheldrake, came to speak in Christchurch a couple of years ago, and I, I found, um, I was just Googling to try and find out what room it was in or something, and I found a skeptic's message board, and someone was saying, how outrageous, Christchurch University allowed Rupert Sheldrake, a total charlatan, you know, non-scientist, uh, to come and speak, um, get in touch with the Vice-Chancellor and make sure this gets shut down. And there were people just piling in, you know, what a yeah, what a fraud, and he's going to be talking about telepathy and dogs, ha, ha, ha. Um, you know, as if like, because yeah, Sheldrake's done these amazing, very well organized experiments with animals, like we all know, they can kind of tell that you're coming home when they don't know that, you know what I mean, you come home at an unexpected time and someone says, oh, that's funny, the cat just went and sat up on the thing. So anyone who's got cats and dogs for, for a while, for a few years notices these things. And he's like, well, let's, let's experiment with that. And both of you are like, what a ridiculous thing to experiment with. And we all know that's rubbish. They can't possibly, they can't be telepathy, and certainly not in dogs. And he runs these experiments incredibly, well set up with you know very scrupulous science we're talking about. He was at Oxford or Cambridge biologist. Um, and shows what we all know really that yes, there does seem to be very strong correlation. Similarly with breastfeeding mothers when their babies are away in the feeding, that they start crying at the same time that the mother can actually feel the sensation in her nipple. So Sheldrake's like, that's interesting, let's experiment with it. I mean like, what a charlatan, he's promoting ideas like telepathy. And so there's people going, LOL, Sheldrake thinks dogs are telepathic, yeah, let's shut it down. It's like, you haven't even read his research, and you're telling people to get in touch with the Vice Chancellor. This is like fascist tactics. So anyway, rant over. But basically what I'm saying is if you do have, if I have sparked an interest in any of this stuff, and you go online, and you just, it suddenly all starts to look like a load of bullshit, you know, you use some discernment in, in who's written what you're reading, and you know, it's, it's ideologically charged material. It's like reading about, Israel or something, you know, people, passions run very high on both sides for some reason, because we're talking about the, the boundaries of what's real. Could we make the, um, the slides available on the Facebook Absolutely, page? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good, because then you can follow up, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay.
But it's quite interesting that you didn't talk about the results of your own experiment. Well, I, I kind of lost interest. I mean, there's, like I said, the, the, the data was very dilute. Um, I haven't looked at it for years and years, and I was basically convinced that it wasn't going to create any statistically significant results because of the way I'd set it up. And at that time, I'd already, I, I, that was what, was what was going on. I was um, an honorary research fellow in the religious studies department under Peter Moore, as I said, working in the Darwin computer room back in like 20 years ago. And I started getting emails from someone who I suspect was schizophrenic, who thought I was sending signals backwards into his past. And he was getting like, I was a bit weird. It was before, you know, the first instance I'd experienced of just completely weird stuff going on online, because up to, as I said, up to that point, the web was very utopian and very, like, cooperative. And suddenly, things were starting to turn a bit weird on the web, and I was getting this, and I was, my mind was in quite an open state a lot of the time, shall we say, so I was, um, you know, it was a bit like, oh, this is getting weird. I think I'm just going to let this run. Someone else can worry about the statistics. And I went off traveling and playing music. So, um, but you could, you could actually, you've got, like I say, you've got referenced in some parapsychology conferences in the last about 10 years. So you could probably find out what the results were. But I, I think so there's Has anyone tried to crunch the numbers? Yeah, I think so. I think it, what, what happens is it gets integrated into what they call um, meta-analysis. So you analyze multiple experiments. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's all got, it's all churned away inside some great meta-analysis. Um, any other last questions? I think I've been keeping it. Eric. Um, the question I found fun to ponder is, if physics is time symmetric and we can remember the past, why can't we remember the future? Why can't we remember the future? Yes, that, I mean, there are asymmetries when it comes to consciousness, clearly, in terms of, like I said, all of those instances of the arrow of time are to do with knowledge states, you know, whether it's entropy or to do with quantum mechanical wave collapses. If you took us out of the picture, that arrow is very tenuous. And so, yeah, our minds don't seem to, our minds do seem to be asymmetric. We do remember the past, but not the future. Occasionally there are some, some striking examples of precognition. Of course, if you're a skeptic, you go, well, of course, you know, by some statistical law, you're going to get anomalies occasionally. But there are some really very striking examples where, and, and I think we've all had anecdotal experiences personally that kind of hard to explain away of precognitive just little flashes of things before they happen. So it's possible we, we do, there is an element of remembering the future, but it's very muted for two reasons. One is that we haven't got a language structure to accommodate it. Um, in the same, if you have a word for something, it's kind of not there. In the, you know, if you're an anthropologist, I think you know what I mean. I, mean, yeah. I don't know exactly what I mean, but I know there's something in the fact that, I think Timmy was saying earlier, structuralist, structuralism, the idea that your language shapes what is what is real, what, what your reality consists of. So um, if, if all our language structure is about time flowing forward, like just paddling you know, along a tram, then that's going to affect what we perceive and how we structure that perception. If we started to develop language, a language structure that could accommodate reverse time effects, then we might start to notice them more. Um, and also, but on the other hand, there's also seemingly, just from the data, from the pre-sentiment data, there seems to be a muting. It's not big spike before the picture and big spike after. It's like there's a mirroring, but there's also a, a, a downscaling of it. I was just going to follow up with, like, so could you say something for, like, deja vu? It's sort of something that you could say is yeah. something that's in the future. Like, it's a really muted effect, but it's something I, that when it gets into a certain point, it's like, actually, no, I thought I remembered this. Mm. Um, there have been various reductionist attempts, neuro neuroscience attempts to explain, neuroscientific attempts to explain deja vu using, you know, some kind of, it's about some time delay between two parts of the brain or something. I haven't really looked at it. But my sense is, it's probably, because I, I do believe that there, there are retrocausal, I, you know, I think the world makes sense if you it accommodate some kind of retrocausation and it seems to work at the level of physics. I think child rakes onto something with the life forms and this pre-sentiment data looks pretty convincing to me, and I feel like I've experienced this. So, yeah, I think the world has got some kind of um, retro causality in it, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if deja vu was just one of those little, little glitchy sort of insights that we all get. That everyone knows what you mean. I've never met anyone that's like, I don't know what this. Maybe once I met someone, but you know, you don't meet people are like deja vu. What's that? I don't understand. Everyone gets it, uh, and it's it is mysterious. It's, it's got an uncanny feeling. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, like, because then we've, we've actually got a word to talk about it. Mm. So people yeah. actually understand, uh, understand when, exactly. you, when you mention it in a conversation, people actually know what you're yeah. talking about.
Yeah, we've got some other weird things you might have to contain certain drugs and you come back and you're like, that's this weird thing, but you, you haven't got any word for it. And so if someone else might have had the same experience, you're never going to know that you have because you can't share the word. Um, so that, yeah, that's a whole level of, of this that I, I'm not qualified to explore really. It'd be really interesting for some philosophers of science to talk to some anthropologists and linguists and things and really like unravel all of this. Um, yeah. I'm, this is, I'm just dabbling here and, uh, you know, I hope, as you can probably tell, I'm not really qualified in anything other than that. So I just, uh, I like talking about stuff. Um, any more questions? What about paradoxes? If you're talking about things like virtual causality, eventually you run into the problem where you get an infinite feedback loop of reality and just how, how do you untangle that? There, there are John, um, John Kramer, that, the, the video of the, of the yeah. physicist, he's looking particularly at that about you get these sorts of restrictions and boundary conditions on what's possible. It's not so much that the future's causing the present, it's a subtle difference, it's that the present is somehow dependent on the future. There's a kind of relation between them that is, you know, which conventional science doesn't recognize, which means that what the present can be like is conditioned by how the future is going to be. Um, so that again, supports determinism in a very significant well, way. Well, no, that, no, that, that, yeah, can I erase that definition? I don't think that's a good, example, a good uh, account of it at all. But it's, um, yeah. These questions, these paradoxes have been explored, and if, I, I'm not the person to ask, and this is getting quite technical, so, uh, but check out John Kramer's work, because he's, yeah. he's written extensively on it. And, uh, just about, and, he, and he's, not, uh, he's not evangelical with it, he's not, he's not claiming to have invented time travel, or that he's about to, or he's not got some big crazy theory that he wants everyone to believe in. He simply said, hey, we can make sense of quantum mechanics much more smoothly and elegantly and beautifully if we just allow this backwards time thing. And then once you let that in, it's like, oh, and then this, oh, and then you can look at this that way, and, and then time travel starts to seem a little bit less ridiculous. Um, but there are, you know, the paradoxes have to be resolved. The famous things like if you travel back in time and jump your grandfather, you know, uh, you create impossibilities. Um, so then, how, the, how how could that sort of thing be restricted? Could you ever physically go back in time? Again, it's, um, there's a whole area of speculative science around this stuff that I, I've not really looked at. I think I'm just Considering what you showed previously in the picture where you have you know, the, uh, the spike in the reaction for the, for the old image, yeah. and you have the slight difference in the gap. Yeah. To me, this kind of weirdly seems, seems like a ripple effect. If you imagine like, you know, time as a sort of field or whatever, and if you have a... Uh, Sort of ripple or event, it affects the locality around it, and thus you can find like maybe in the future, and that's obvious. In the future, you're 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 influenced by an event. I think that it's like throwing a pebble in the pond. Yeah, exactly. The time ripples. It's like we are looking at ripples of a splash. Yeah, exactly. And the bigger the splash, the more you feel it. Hence, the image has to be quite shocking. Um, and you throw a big brick in the pond, and it really, you know. Um, and I think that's why I say there was a lot of pre often with these big disasters, plane crashes and 9-11 and things like that. You can get more stories of precognition than usual, it would appear. Again, this is all anecdotal. But because it's almost like you know, such a huge thing is thrown in the ponds that the waves are so enormous that even though people are very insensitive to this stuff, a few sensitive people pick up on it.